Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Leslie Vinjamori. I'm an associate fellow here on the US and the Americas program at Chatham House. It is a delight to see so many of you here this evening. Uh, before we begin, I would like to thank Liberal International for this opportunity given to Chatham House to co-host tonight's Isaiah Berlin lecture, which will be given by Governor Howard Dean on the US elections 2016 and the future of liberal democracy. It's a pleasure, I should say, for me and an honor as well to welcome Governor Howard Dean to Chatham House this evening. Uh, Howard Dean, as many of you will know, was government of Vermont from 1991 to 2003. In 2004, he was a candidate for the Democratic nomination for the President of the United States. And from 2005 to 2009, he was chairman of the Democratic National Committee. Governor Dean also founded Democracy for America, which is an organization that seeks to promote more progressive candidates at all levels of government. He remains involved with that. He is widely recognized for having devised some of the most highly successful campaign strategies, including the 50 state strategy. Governor Dean was also a practicing physician for 10 years earlier in his career. Today, he remains very active in political life, as any of you who are following the US elections will know. He is active through multiple channels. He is committed to health care, the expansion of grassroots politics, alternative energy, and early child, childhood development. And Gover Governor Dean remains one of the most important figures in the Democratic Party today. So welcome. It is a real honor. I would also like to welcome the president of Liberal International, who will say a few words tonight about the Isaiah Berlin Lecture, Dr. Julia Minoves. From 2005 until 2014, Dr. Minovas was vice president and, lady, and later deputy president of Liberal International. And in April 2014, he was elected president of Liberal International. Dr. Minovas has a long and distinguished career. He was the foreign minister of the Principality of Andorra from 2001 to 2007, a minister of economic development, as well as spokesman for the government from 2007 to 2009, earlier, 1996 to 1997, he was elected vice president of the General Assembly of the United Nations. Dr. Minovas, thank you, and welcome to Chatham House, and thank you for allowing us to co-host with you. Thank you very much for these introductory words. It is a, a real honor for Liberal International to uh, uh, do this lecture here at uh, this prestigious house, uh, Chatham House, and uh, to have these uh, wonderful uh, guest. We uh, met with Governor Dean in Mexico um, not too long ago, a few months ago, and he honored us with his presence at our 60th Congress of Liberal International. And uh, he gave such a good lecture, more than a lecture, it was more of a dialogue with our members at Liberal International, that we asked him whether he would be willing to actually come and to be the first NDI uh, member to actually highlight one of our big Isaiah Berlin lectures. And his response was, maybe. Then we asked him again, and again, and again, and he said, I have to. You know, this is, uh, this is something I have to do. And, and, and it's not easy, because it's in London. It's far away. So we appreciate your time. We appreciate your commitment. And we appreciate your commitment, because I think you saw in Mexico, at our Congress, that Liberal International stands for values that you share, those values, progressive values, defense of human rights across the world, of uh, you know, making sure that nobody is discriminated, making sure that everybody has access to uh, you know, the same rights that we sometimes, in some countries, we take for granted, but they are so dear to so many people who actually suffer without them in other parts of the world. So thank you very much. And uh, let me just say a few words about Liberal International. Liberal International is the International Federation of Political Parties that promote liberal values and liberal democracy across the globe. We have over 100 members, political parties, and organizations uh, in over 80 nations in our planet. Uh, many years ago, we instituted this lecture, the Isaiah Berlin Lecture, in honor of uh, Sir Isaiah Berlin. He was a Latvian-British uh, social and political theorist, probably the greatest liberal philosopher based in the British Isles of the second half of the 20th century. 
And he was also a professor at Oxford University, Oxford University, where Liberal International was founded in 1947, at a moment in which we were, after World War II, we had seen the disaster of the Nazi regimes and the inhumanity of those regimes, and we were coming into a time of Cold War with also the difficulties that we saw in the communist arena uh, across the uh, Iron Wall in Europe. Isaiah Berlin is essential, particularly now, for us, for Liberal International, because we are in the moment in which we are redrafting our manifesto of 1947. We had our original manifesto in 1947. We had another one in 1997, taking stock of what had happened to the world after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And we gathered at Oxford University recently, this year, to actually understand what are the challenges for the 21st century and how, as liberals, we can respond to them. I'm sure that listening to Howard Dean tonight, as we listen to him in Mexico, we will gather and get many ideas for this new liberal manifesto. Past speakers of the Isaiah Berlin Lecture have been Mark Rutte, the Prime Minister of the Netherlands, Michael Ignatieff, the former leader of the Liberal Party of Canada, Pierre Petitgru, who was then Foreign Minister of Canada, Annemie Neitz, the Minister of State of Foreign Affairs of Belgium, and most recently, last year, Cecilia Malmström, the European Commissioner for Trade, who talked to us about the issues concerning the uh, transatlantic agreement on trade. You have already explained who Governor Howard Dean is. I would also just want to say that Howard Dean is also a politician that lives and uh, acts and operates in the 21st century. His uh, Democracy for America, this progressive organization, is a progressive online organization with over one million members. He is in touch with millennials. You just had to see him come into this room and talk to all these young people and we want to know what he thinks of where we're going with the U.S. election, but probably for your questions with the rest of the world. Thank you very much. Have a good lecture. Well, thank you for the very kind introductions. Um, I should say that Democracy for America and I have a temporary uh, separation. Uh, they are supporting Senator Sanders. I am supporting Hillary Clinton. So <laughs> it's all in the family. My brother now runs Democracy for America, and we have wonderful discussions. My mother referees them at the age of 87. Um, I thought that I would spend a little bit of time talking about the state of democracy uh, and some of the problems, and I'm, I'm sure we're going to spend a great deal of time on, uh, on uh, Donald Trump, which I get asked about everywhere I go. Um, NDI, I'm also on the board of the National Democratic Institute, and we organized a, uh, a meeting in Serbia last week or the week before, which, bring, which is the kind of thing that NDI does, and we brought together uh, the three leading parties from seven countries on the grounds that that's where they can talk to each other, which they don't do at home. And it was terrific, except that we had to organize a special hour to speak about Donald Trump. Otherwise, er the whole program would have been disrupted with these um, questions. Uh, I also uh, just want to say how much I like talking in Europe. Uh, it's, a, it's so refreshing. I know everybody in Europe believes that the Americans are always acting without thinking, and it's true, so it's wonderful to come to a place where they think without acting. <laughs> So uh, let me be slightly serious for a moment. Um, uh, Winston Churchill was fond of saying uh, that democracy is the worst form of government except for every other. And I think we've had a very difficult time uh, with democracy. The roots uh, in the last uh, a couple of decades. The roots, uh, you, you could trace this back to anywhere. I prefer to trace it back to 1994 when for the first time the Republicans took over the House in the United States. And they did it by polarizing the electorate as much as they possibly could and demonizing their opponents. Since that time, that's become a weapon that's been used all over the world. Uh, and of course, the Republicans didn't invent this in 1994. This is a standard uh, way of gaining power, is to demonize the opponent, say outrageous things about them, get some people to believe them, hopefully enough people just to put you over the edge. And I think what we're, what we're seeing now uh, is a product of the use of demonization of, of the other in order to gain political power and the close association between capitalism and democracy. Most people believe, and I do as well, 
uh, that de democracy and capitalism go hand in hand. And for the most part in the world, that's true, true democracy. We're not talking about the kind of election we had in Uganda uh, this past weekend. Um, and most people believe that's true. And I actually believe uh, that capitalism is a good thing. But the problem is that capitalism has uh, created an enormous uh, downdraft for a lot of middle class people. This is sort of the Bernie Sanders message and why he's done so well. And the truth is that no system in America or anywhere else in the world works without some kind of regulation. Uh, and what you've seen on Wall Street, for example, and in the city as well, uh, is essentially a rugby game with no rules. And I think everybody understands what happens when you do that. So I'm not one of these people who think that capitalism is a bad thing. I think it's probably the most effective, efficient uh, system of economic system we've ever had. Uh, but I also think that it's in a position now where, and I don't really blame all the people on Wall Street for doing all these things that have gotten them into the trouble. I hope most of you have seen The Big Short. It's one of the greatest movies I ever saw. And, it, and thanks to Selena Gomez, they do a wonderful job of explaining all the interesting problems in it. Uh, but I think the main problem is our tax codes. At least in the states, we have made it more profitable to invest in derivatives, which don't accomplish anything, than we have to invest in housing uh, and infrastructure. And so the real example, the, the real solution to this in the long run, much as politicians all over the uh, Western world are talking about more regulation and taxing wealthy people and so forth, none of which I have anything particular against, but it's not the most efficient way to change things. I think we have to begin uh, with our tax codes, and I think we have to reward the kind of behavior we want because incentives, in fact, work. So the reason I, I take this veering off into this discussion of capitalism because I think in most people's minds in the world that capitalism and democracy are thought of as twins. So that when capitalism begins to fail people, then people cast aspersions on democracy, and, the, and Putin has been a great example of this, when capitalism failed in Russia because we weren't able to control the behavior of the oligarchs, uh, then democracy failed, a nascent democracy failed shortly thereafter. Now, uh, you know, the Russians don't exactly have a long history of, of democratic institutions, but our economic system and the outcome of our economic system for ordinary people anywhere in the world is going to be connected with our governance system. And the notion that we need strong people in government and that we value stability over freedom, which is what you've seen in places like Hungary and recently Poland, comes from the fear that people have of not being able to provide for their families, of not being able to get jobs once they lose them, of having a gloomier future for their children than they do. So this is not a matter of just standing up for liberal democracy and our values. It's also a matter of making sure our economic system actually meets the, meets the needs of all of our citizens and not just a few of our citizens. And I think the kind of rhetoric that Senator Sanders is using is not terribly helpful. Uh, because I think what the real issue is, not that he's wrong, but the real issue is we have to be all in this together. And if you single out a particular group, even if it's oligarchs and billionaires, you fall into the same trap that Donald Trump is essentially ex uh, exhibiting, although his, uh, some of his uh, rhetoric is clearly identifiable as racism, which I don't think is true of Senator Sanders. We have to behave responsibly as democratic leaders, and if we fail, we cause democracy to fail. And there's been an enormous amount of short-term election-based thinking that's gone on. And we are now living with those consequences. We are living with the consequences, for example, of a Hungarian government that didn't tell the truth to its people, uh, that squandered huge amounts of money. And of course, there was a predictable reaction. And now Viktor Orban uh, is eliminating democratic institutions. Uh, we are living with the consequences in the United States of a terribly polarized electorate and a terribly polarized government, which really has been relatively ineffective uh, in domestic policy and changes uh, in the kinds of systems, education, infrastructure that need to be changed, not only in our country, but in many others. We've been ineffective in doing that because people have decided that they want to use polarization. Responsibility is part of governing. And one of the things I think we fail in the West on is we talk about our rights all the time. In the states, it's gun rights, abortion rights, gay rights. I don't hear many discussions anymore about our obligations as citizens. There's too much focus on what the government owes to us and not enough focus on what we owe the government. And what we owe the government isn't so much the government, it's us. If you're not willing to run for election, and why would you in this atmosphere, 
that's a loss for everybody. If you're not willing to vote, and a lot of people have given up so they don't, particularly in the United States, then that's a problem for democracy. So democracy is as fragile or as strong as those of us who are willing to talk about our obligations. And we have to start training the public to speak about obligations, which takes political courage, which is in short supply in many of our Western democracy. So that's, I think, job one, is less focus on our rights and more focus on what our obligations are that will lead to our rights. And I am not talking about making obligations mandatory. Those, especially in the United States, which is probably the most libertarian country on the face of the earth. But having a sense of citizenship, which includes a, a, a sense of obligation to something greater than ourselves, is the core. It's what great leadership is about. If leaders ask that, then they have to behave that way. And of course, it's impossible for leaders to ask that unless they do that themselves. And that is where I think there's been a tremendous amount of short-term thinking. Uh, I'm sure I'll hear from the embassy in the morning. Uh, but I think, I think the Brexit debate is happening because the prime minister made a calculation some time ago that he would keep his party together and the right wing in the party by promising this. And this is like a child who played with matches and now the entire building is on fire and it's too late to put it out. And the risks are enormous. David Cameron could be the last prime minister of the United Kingdom. Because I think most of us believe that if you exit the European Union, Scotland will exit the United Kingdom. And I actually had a discussion with a very bright guy from Wales who was in uh, New Hampshire covering the American primary, who told me he thought Wales would leave. And I poo-pooed it. I thought it was preposterous. But the fact is he pointed out that a great deal of Welsh trade is with Ireland. And they don't want to have to cross a border and deal with all those things. What would be the case in Northern Ireland? This incredibly hard-won peace agreement after years and years of, as, as in somebody who's involved in the, in the uh, Irish election said, blowing up children and women, for, supposedly for a cause. Finally, we've had more or less sustained peace. What happens if you make a hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland? I don't think anybody thought about these things when they were busy trying to get their party together and trying to bring the anti-European together, people together with a pro-European party. And it's a case of short-term thinking for political advantage, blowing up in your face and no longer being able to be controlled. I think we've got this problem in our country. Donald Trump is so far out there that should he become president, and there is a chance, and I'm sure we'll get to this in the question period, there is a chance that he becomes president. People are horrified to hear that in most parts of the world that I go to, because they would like the predictability of a Hillary Clinton. But if that should happen, and anything I can attest, because I was the person who was going to be president before there was a single vote cast, and that only lasted one primary. <laughs> so anything can happen in politics. And if you can get as far as Donald Trump, you better believe there's a, I'll tell you what the scenario is. Donald Trump gets past the 15th of March, after which day all primaries in the Republican Party are winner take all. There are a couple of candidates. He gets 35, 40% of the vote. That means he takes every single delegate in a few, a few more big states. He is the nominee, and Mike Bloomberg decides to come in and run as a third party. Mike Bloomberg cannot win a single state. And I did that calculation in 2008 because I thought he might run then. Uh, he can't win a single state, but he inevitably will take enough votes away from the Democratic candidate because he will soak up all those moderates who want to leave the Republican Party and who, to whom Hillary Clinton is an acceptable alternative, and Donald Trump becomes elected president. It can happen. So we should be afraid, very afraid. <laughs> there are worse things that could happen. Ted Cruz, who I think fundamentally doesn't really believe in democracy, could be the next president of the United States. That would be even more frightening. So the point is, that there has to be some forethought. And we haven't had a lot of that lately. I, I have great admiration, even though she doesn't represent my end of the political spectrum, although in America she probably would, for Angela Merkel. I think Angela Merkel is a real leader. Is she perfect? No. Do I disagree with some of the things she's done? Yes. Has she stood up for the core values for which she was elected and for which I believe Europe stands? Yes, she has. And I think under great political pressure, and I believe Angela Merkel is really what we seek and a great leader. She may be law, she may lose. Great leaders sometimes lose. They lose because they did the right thing. 
Uh, and since this is a, a, a Lib Dem lecture, I want to say just a couple of things about Nick Clegg. Nick Clegg is a personal friend, and I helped him in his first campaign and continued to speak with him thereafter and just met with him this morning for a sort of an update. I think Nick Clegg did something which I wish more leaders would do, and it cost him and his party 50 seats. Nick Clegg took the Liberal Democrats into government, a government that he wasn't terribly comfortable with, for two reasons. First of all, the, American, I mean, the British people had rejected the Labor government, and Nick didn't feel like it was proper to counteract the wishes of the electorate by going into coalition with, with, uh, with the Labor people. And it would have been difficult, because it, you would have had to patch together a few single party, two party, uh, two seat parties, and that would have been hard. Nick Clegg also was the head of a party that had not been in government for 75 years. And I'm a very frank speaker, so I'll say this, and hopefully I won't insult anybody. After I first came over and did a first, my first fundraiser with him, I turned to him and I said, you know, half the people in this room that I just met tonight don't want you to be in government because they want to complain. That's what they want to do. Nick understood that, and he took the party into government. They paid a huge price as a party. But he stood up for what he believed in. It's always hard when you're a junior partner in a coalition. You always get the blame because your base is not where you have to be sometimes. He didn't, never gets any credit for having modified uh, the conservative program. Now the conservatives, of course, are going to implement the rest of their program, which wasn't so popular. So I just want to say Nick is the kind of person that I believe is a great leader, even though what he did led to the decimation of his party. And I predict right here now that he will be back and that his party will be back, especially if there's a Brex Brexit. And I really pray for the sake of all of us, uh, British and American alike, because you are, after all, our closest ally, uh, that, the, the, that the sun does not set on, uh, on the, the British Empire for the last time, because I think that's what is it's at stake. Let me talk about a little bit more about America. Uh, what is our road to getting out of this polarization it's very difficult time, because it's, it's not quite as bad as you all think it is over here, because, of course, I'm sure the Daily Mail says all sorts of outrageous things on the front page, uh, and it's lots of fun to pass. We have our version, the New York Post, for those of you who spent time in America. I, the headline writer in the New York Post is clearly the most undercompensated journalist in New York, because he's certainly the funniest, uh, although I wouldn't buy the paper, because you can see the headline as you pass by, and the rest of it is not worth your 25 cents. Um, <laughs> But I, 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 how are we going to get out of this? Well, and I, I have some students here who have heard this before, so I apologize to them. The new generation of young people is not at all like we are. In many ways, we're more polarized. We're um, less forgiving of our opposition. And they are much more focused on results. Um, unlike us, uh, they don't have to organize in order to change everything into large institutions. In fact, they don't like big institutions. Why? Because big institutions, one, are unresponsive and you have to get 15 people's provision, if not 60s, to do anything. And two, they don't really, they, they know that big institutions, if faced between choosing between their mission and their existence, will always choose their existence, which of course is often the end of the mission. And three, they don't need them. Because if they have a cause, they can go on the internet and find 500,000 people who agree with them within a matter of days, bombard Washington or London with certain uh, desires, and these things happen. They killed a major uh, intellectual property bill because the, the unintendedly would have gotten rid of YouTube. Um, they, uh, there was a young lady named Molly Catchpole who went to the University of Rhode Island, which is a working class uh, based university. And uh, when Verizon tried to charge for paying online, paying the bill online, which is a pretty stupid business decision, but they did it because they thought they, that would be great. They'd get $2 a month plus times 30 million. Um, she went online, got 100,000, 200,000 people to say they'd switch to AT, and Verizon changed their view. Bank of America tried to charge $5 for a debit card. She went online again. The bank fought her for, fought her for 48 days and finally threw up their hands and backed out of it. The idea that what would have happened in our generation is, oh, well, the hell with it. It's only another $5. I'm too busy to do something, and the bank is too strong. That doesn't exist with these young people. But the problem is they don't need politics to do most of what they want, because they can fundamentally change the way things happen without politics. So the other characteristic that's really important 
is that unlike, at least in America, my generation, who are willing to fight to the death over the issues we're fighting on, we're going to continue to do so, they actually would much prefer to work together on the 80% of things that they do agree on and ignore, for the time being, the 20% of the things they don't agree on. And it's a different generation. The ideological bandwidth is, is, more, is less, less wide. So I'll give you an example of this, just an interesting polling statistic. So, so when I was a chair of the Democratic National Committee, my chief of staff was a Pentecostal minister. And we're sitting around one day, and I said, you know, if you're a red-letter Christian, that is a, 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 a Christian who has a Bible in which uh, the words of Jesus were actually are in red and all the commentary and the prophets and everything else is in black. If you're a red-letter Christian, you only read what Jesus said. Jesus looks like he's substantially the left of Bernie Sanders, right? I mean, so why is it that evangelicals don't vote for Democrats? So the pollster's in the room, so he says, aha, I'll do a poll for $40,000. So, so I said, great. So he polls, we polled, this is 10 years ago, we polled evangelical Christians. Those over 55 were driven by two issues. One was abortion rights and the other was gay rights. Those evangelical Christians under 35, their number one priority was poverty and their number two priority was climate change. And I said, how is this possible that evangelical Christians basically agree with what I would call secular activists on university campuses? because there is a much narrower ideological bandwidth and they are willing to work together on issues no matter that there may be other issues that they can't agree on. So when these folks get into parliament and get into the House of Representatives and become senators, there's going to be a change because they have no tolerance for this. Now today, young people are getting into these places. The problem is there's so few of them, they get socialized by the institution before they manage to socialize the institution. It is going to be, take a while for these guys to get into politics. Why? Because politics is incredibly unattractive. It just is incredibly unattractive right now. You have to, you go in, you have to pay your dues over a long period of time. Uh, the, the, you get socialized. You're not really accomplishing anything. I mean, think about a 30-year career in Parliament or the United States Senate. What have you really done? You're built, your name is on a couple of bills. Ted Kennedy probably has some accomplishments, but even he, one of the lions of the Senate, 30 years, 99 other people you have to convince. Why would you do that if you can create models to change everything? So I'm going to close with an example of what this generation can do and what we have ahead of us, and then we'll sit down and take rude questions about Donald Trump. <laughs> so uh, after I finished my campaign, I was asked to judge an internet contest because the campaign was, had a lot to do with the internet. And the internet contest was put together by a, an organization called DoSomething.org, which incidentally is looking for a new marketing officer if anybody wants to apply, and I'm sure they play very well. So DoSomething.org gives a $100,000 prize every year to the idea that young people come up with that's most likely to make substantial change. So I interviewed this person, and she doesn't get the award, but here's what she does. She's, when she was eight, she was about 21 or 2 at the time. So when she was 18, she comes from LaGuardia High School, which, is a, a, which would be a state school in, in England, uh, in New York. And she ends up at the University of Vermont, which is a rather unusual path. She's 18 years old. She finds a mentor who knows a lot about international relations. The mentor convinces her to go to South Sudan, which at the time was a war zone. She goes to South Sudan, and the lesson that she comes up with is, at 18 years old is that American foreign aid makes people more dependent, not less dependent, which I think is probably true. So instead of coming back and deciding she's going to have a career in politics or work for somebody in the Hill or whatever, she goes online and she finds a foundation in New York called the Siegel Foundation, which agrees to give her $1,000 to do something to fix this problem. She goes across the hall, talks to her friend, and the two of them start something called Sparks Microgrant. And they go to Africa, to Rwanda, Uganda, and now Burundi until the recent upheavals where they had to stop their operation temporarily. And they begin to hire African university graduates who are having trouble finding jobs. And they train them, and they send them into small rural villages around East Africa. And they go through a process. They say, we're going to give you a $3,000 check. And 
in, in order to get that check, first of all, this is the only one you're ever going to get, so you have to design the program, figure out how to build whatever it is you want to build, and figure out how to maintain it and govern it into the future. This is all you get. So there were a lot of different things that were done. One of the more interesting ones to me was they wanted a health center, uh, and the conclusion was they built a bridge. And how did that happen? Because the next village over that was a mile and a half away had a health center, but it was on the other side of a river that couldn't be crossed unless you went up stream six miles, crossed the river, and then came back down. So they built a bridge across the river. Essentially, they now had a health center. This is the kind of stuff they did. But as Sasha will tell you, the real genius of this has nothing to do with what they built. This is the fundamental difference. It was all in the decision-making process. Because in many patriarchal rural societies around the world, the women do all the work and the men make the decisions. And what had to happen for this to ha go forward, since the women were going to do the work, is that women had to fully participate in the process. So they did, and they fundamentally changed the power relationships in rural African village. There was one quote from a guy in one of the newsletters that said, my wife and I make joint decisions about what's going to happen in the family. That is what foreign aid is supposed to be about. It's not supposed to be about building a bridge and then maybe your standard of living goes up a little bit. It's supposed to empower people, and we have failed to do that in general speaking with foreign aid, and it's a big mistake. At 26, she now runs a million dollar a year foundation, and she has had more effect than anybody who has served in the Senate for 35 years in the United States. This is the future of politics. If we won't get out of the way and take responsibility and start speaking about people's obligations, the next generation will. Whether they will get involved in politics and change the fundamental governance problems that we have as a result of demagoguery, as a result of short-term thinking, that is the big question is, is there time? I'm an optimist, and I think the answer is yes. Thanks very much.